Well, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, listening to the governor and his uh, message just uh, an hour or so ago and hearing Myron Franz, uh, both of them were conciliatory. Both of them had the idea or, or uh, thought that we have to work towards this next session. I appreciate that they uh, didn't feel like we were being blamed, but they just recognized that uh, sometimes you're a little short or you're, or you're a little over. But frankly, both of them said that this is really something that is small in light of uh, the overall picture. And, and frankly, as I looked at this uh, budget forecast, it felt like it was obsolete on arrival. Uh, they're just, uh, they're already talking about we have to look towards February, and I would agree with that. Uh, first of all, let me say I got good news and bad news. I'll give you the good news first. Our economy is booming. Unemployment as, is at near record lows. Job growth is way up. Consumer optimism is way up. GDP, last two quarters, two in a row, is, is well over 3%, which hits in that 20-year average of the past of 3.1%. Good news, good news, good news, good news, good news. Uh, the only bad news I have is that the forecast seems to project the worst, uh, when I believe uh, in a much better picture. In, in that regard, we're just going to have to wait to February to, to, to see. But when you use uh, GDP numbers of 2.2%, when it appears to be higher than that, every number looks bad. Uh, when you don't factor in the chip money that we're going to get where it would almost be equal, that makes it look bad. And when you first have the federal tax relief in last February's forecast, but then you take it out of this one, uh, again, it created a number that's a little lower than it needs to be. But, but I'm optimistic. I see everything around me. I see signs of good things happening. And I think we're going to see that in February. But regardless of that, we'll figure it out. Uh, but, you know, I'm not worried about where we're at. I feel like we're moving in a great direction. Thank you. Well, I would agree. I think uh, there's a lot of really good signs in this forecast. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, but I think it's, it's over cautious. And, and uh, I don't know that that's on purpose. Uh, I had been predicting that this administration who uh, basically controls the forecast process uh, would uh, manipulate the numbers to show a deficit. I don't. I don't necessarily know that that's what's happened, but uh, I am. Uh, I do believe that this is over overly cautious, and I think uh, I agree with uh, Senator Gazelka's uh, assessment that this forecast is basically obsolete uh, on arrival. Um, it's forecasting uh, economic growth at rates uh, of you know 2.2 percent when. Uh, current economic growth is, uh, you know, the last two quarters, 3.1 percent and 3.3 percent. Um, so, unfortunately, this uh, this forecast doesn't take into account the great economic environment that we have right now, uh, and that we've been seeing lately. Um, and I think we'll uh, look forward to the February forecast where we see that um, that economic excitement. Now, I, I also think that historically. Uh, the November forecasts have been a little more pessimistic, and the February forecasts uh, have shown a little more uh, growth uh, from the November forecasts. Um, I think we'll probably see that. Um, the chip money, uh, we have assurances from Congress that uh, we will get reimbursed for that. Um, that would basically make this a, a balanced forecast as opposed to a deficit. So um, I think there's a lot of factors that, that uh, make this overly uh, pessimistic when I think there's a lot of reasons uh, because of our economic growth currently that we're uh, experiencing in this economy uh, that we should be, frankly, very optimistic. So um, we'll look forward to a, a better economic uh, uh, forecast in the, in the November, or excuse me, in the February forecast. Um, I would agree with the governor and, and with the senators uh, who spoke and said uh, that uh, we've frankly spent too much. Uh, Republicans have been battling that increased spending for years, um, and I think uh, that in, in this forecast now you're starting to see those chickens coming home to roost. Um, we can't see, uh, you know, when Democrats had complete control of state government, it was an 11 percent increase in state spending. Um, this last biennium, as much as we battled the governor, we had to give in, and, um, and it was a 9 percent increase in spending. Now that also, uh, they count the tax relief as spending, so it's a little bit of an artificial spending number, but certainly still the spending has been uh, much too high in state government. Um, for those that wonder if the tax relief had an impact on this, um, tax relief uh, taken into account in this forecast, the revenue from the last biennium to this biennium, uh, still $2.3 billion of growth in revenue. Um, 
and, and from this biennium to the next, uh, $3.2 billion in growth in revenue. So uh, the revenue is not the problem here. Uh, the spending is the problem. And, and anybody who can read these basic numbers uh, can come to that inclusion or conclusion. I, I also think um, it's very interesting. What we saw in the February forecast uh, uh, last February um, was a, an assumption that, a, uh, that we'd have higher economic growth because the feds would pass a tax bill. Um, and provide tax relief, which would increase uh, the economic growth in the country. Um, about a month ago, the Council of Economic Advisors met and, and decided that they were going to remove that assumption. Um, now the assumption in this forecast is that no tax bill at the federal level will pass. Um, so for those of you following along at home, when we don't pass tax relief, we don't see economic growth, and we lose revenue to the state. Um, so we have less revenue now projected to come into the state because the federal government has not passed tax relief. Um, these are really basic economic principles, which we've been trying to explain to folks for years. Uh, but you can see them here very clearly in practice. Um, now, uh, since that economic Council of Economic Advisors meeting a month ago, um, we see that it looks very likely that a tax bill at the federal level will pass, um, that that tax relief will spur economic growth even beyond probably what we have right now. Um, you saw what happened with the stock market uh, today. And uh, since they've uh, passed the bills out of the House and Senate, that bill's in conference committee now. And it looks very likely that that bill uh, will get signed into law. So um, I think that gives us a lot uh, to be optimistic about. And I think when we see that economic growth that we're experiencing right now reflected in our numbers, um, we're going to have uh, numbers that reflect uh, a surplus. And, and frankly, uh, we think that's a good thing. So if we can get our spending under control here in the state um, and reflect the economic growth that we're actually seeing in the economy right now, um, I think we've got uh, really good things ahead for the state of Minnesota. Well, I would say that my takeaway from this is is actually pretty positive. When you look at the when you dig into the book and you look at the numbers, um, it, it's an interesting snapshot. But if you look at what actually is happening in Minnesota in relation to the rest of the country, we've got the lowest unemployment in 17 years at 3.3 percent. That can be nothing but positive. We've got real GDP growth well above the nation. We've got uh, Minnesota's um, annual job growth exceeds the U.S. average in 9 and 11 categories, and we've got wage growth that's going from 4.3 to 4.7 percent. So if you look at the book, all the categories, Minnesota is doing really, really well. And this doesn't even take into account of the, the tax relief that we passed this year, because these are 2016 numbers, it doesn't take into account of that or the infrastructure funding that we put into the economy. So I think, um, I think the other main takeaway that uh, the, both the other leaders have talked about is the fact that the, um, these numbers are not assuming the federal government doing anything. And once, you, once something happens to the federal government with that, with the CHIP funding, it's really kind of a wash. So I, I think the main takeaway from this is that we're going to have to wait until February until we know what the actual numbers is. But the other main takeaway is that we're absolutely doing the right things in Minnesota. All of the numbers look great for what we're doing here. All the numbers are positive, And uh, I think it's because of the great work that we've been doing here. So. Well, I first would like to thank the governor for recognizing that this forecast is very complex and that there's a great amount of uncertainty built into it. And I think the two leaders said it very, very well. Uh, we are dealing with an apples and oranges forecast from last February to this November as far as how it was measured. And I, I believe that is uh, something that we have to really say, okay, we're going to wait till February to get the correct numbers. We, Minnesota is looking good. It's looking strong. It's looking healthy. And we're, uh, we are not in a downturn. So that is something to um, congratulate everybody because it was a budget that was put by everybody together. And I think um, we need to, to say thank you to the governor and to the other side also for their hard work. Um, with the federal uh, tax bill and the CHIP funding, and then of course you've got till the end of the year, you've got the Christmas season, you've got bonuses, you've got the capital gains issue that could be taken before the end of the year. There's a lot of variables that we haven't addressed yet. And I just want to say something um, about the 
you know, we, we did spend a lot of money, and uh, we had a 7.7% increase in K-12 spending and a 6.4% increase in higher ed to address some comments that were made previously. So um, we, did, we did pretty well on the spending, and uh, just looking forward to uh, some reforms and getting our budget in line and that February forecast. Thank you. Well, I, I got to say something, huh? Well, I'll just reiterate really quickly, you know, <clears throat> you would be looking at a surplus today if it wasn't for the CHIP funding, which the $178 million we expect will come through, and if it wasn't for the fact that in the February forecast there was an assumption that there was going to be a federal tax bill, and in this forecast there's an assumption that there will not be a federal tax bill when it looks pretty clear like they're probably going to get something together at the federal level. But just that change in assumption between uh, assuming there was going to be one in February and not assuming one now and that $178 million of CHIP funding, that's the difference between having a uh, projected deficit now and a surplus. So without those uh, two things or with those two changes, we'd be looking at a surplus today. And I think that it appears that things are going to come around to have a uh, significantly better forecast than in February. If I can make one more comment, too, about our tax relief bill. Um, uh, it's been listed as $657 million of tax relief. Really, the tax relief was a lower number than that because it included local government aid, county program aid, still funding towards government. Uh, but we are very proud of the tax relief that we got for seniors and their Social Security income, uh, farmers and their, their, their property tax got relief, small businesses and their tax, property tax got relief. Uh, those that had student loans, they get a $500 credit per year, first in the nation. So some really, really good things that we got done that we're proud of. And the spending, you know, I would agree with the speaker and the others that it was more than we wanted to spend, but that was our give to the governor. Uh, it was, if you look at uh, real spending, real dollars, uh, biennium to biennium, it was over $4 billion more increase. And that, that was the agreement that we all struck. But to say now that we should give up that tax relief, uh, if anybody says that, it's just a real mistake. Those are real dollars that are getting into uh, Minnesotans' hands that I think will greatly appreciate it. So any questions? How do you counter what you just heard from Democrats mm -hmm. saying after eight straight surpluses, Republican legislature brought you deficits? Well, first of all, this is a forecast. It's not actual dollars. And so, and then when you hear uh, Commissioner Franz and the governor say, hey, this is a blip, this is not a, um, a, it's serious, but it's not really accurate yet. That's why we're all waiting until February. And you heard all of the different issues of why we think it's not accurate. I'm not worried about that. And, and in the end, uh, you know, where we're going to be next year, we're going to, I, I believe we're going to work together. Some of the th key things that we have to pay attention to is the federal tax bill. What are we going to do about that? I'm hoping we have a surplus so that we can work towards that. But also HHS, what are we going to do if they give us less money? How are we going to address that issue? The pension bill we didn't solve. So there's a number of things we can solve and need to solve. And I appreciate the governor seems to be reaching out. Uh, both the speaker and I are going to be working together and, and working with them. If the other folks that were up here before us don't, uh, then we'll just we'll figure that out too. Mr. Speaker, you said it was overcautious and quote, I don't know if that was on purpose. What are you getting at there? Well, you know, I had I had been pretty vocal about making predictions that uh, this this governor and this administration has been more partisan uh, and more political in the things that have traditionally in Minnesota been non political and nonpartisan, like our forecasts. Um, uh, so, you know, I had been predicting uh, for quite some time that the, that the forecast would be a deficit and that that deficit would be exactly equal to the five things that the governor wanted changed from his veto letter, right? I mean, it, it doesn't take a, a, a chess grand, you know, a, a chess master to see what the governor's next move is. Um, whether that's what he's done here or not, I don't know. But obviously, uh, the the uh, economic growth numbers that they have used do not reflect the environment that we're in right now. Um, if we actually used those numbers, uh, the, you would see a surplus today. Um, you know, we've got economic growth the last two quarters, 3.1 and 3.3 percent growth at the federal level. Uh, that doesn't take into account yet the passage of a, a federal tax relief bill, which they say will spur economic growth even further. Um, and, you know, we're projecting here 2.2 percent growth. So, uh, 
I, make of it what you will, um, I don't think anybody has stood here today and said that they believe that this forecast is really accurate. Um, I think uh, Senator Gazalka said it best when he said this is obsolete on arrival. Um, even just based on the, the fact that the federal tax bill looks very, uh, you know, imminent, the passage of that looks imminent now, um, this forecast is based on that not passing. Are you saying that they purposely wanted a deficit to make a rhetorical point? I, you know, I don't know. I'll let you, I'll let you make that decision. Uh, I don't know if that's what they're doing or not, but uh, I had predicted that a while ago. I'll go back and look for my comments from the past. I don't know whether they did it or not. I mean, I hope they didn't. I hope that, that uh, you know, things that remain nonpartisan and, and not political are, are forecasts. Um, I hope this is based on sound information, but I think everyone, including the governor, has stood here today and told you um, that this is not, doesn't reflect a very accurate forecast of where we are right now. Um, you know, so we're all talking about something that we all know isn't very factual, um, which is fine. Uh, it, it's the process that we go through, and, and the Council of Economic Advisors made their decision uh, over a month ago um, that they didn't think a federal tax relief bill was going to pass. Now it looks, you know, like it will be passing shortly. Um, that will change these numbers significantly, and we would see a surplus if they would upgrade the, um, the economic growth numbers. So is it safe to say that none of you up here are rushing to drop a plan to to correct this deficit on paper? I think that everyone that spoke about the level of spending, and I think everyone has, um, is, is correct. I think the, the, the level of spending that we've had in, in state government has been excessive. Um, and I don't think that it's sustainable. Um, and I think that it has put us in this situation. Uh, you know, I, I know that some would, would, and I don't know that they did it today, I don't think anybody did it today, but in, in previous weeks and months, people have implied that because of tax relief um, that we'll have a deficit. Well, uh, you can see from the, the revenue growth numbers that we have you know, 2.2 or $2.3 billion in, in additional revo revenue to this biennium and $3.2 billion of additional revenue growth in the next biennium. That's even after we did the tax relief. Um, so the, the revenue isn't the problem here. The spending is. And, and we need to take a longer term uh, approach and view of our spending. Um, and a lot of it is in HHS. Uh, there's been really excessive growth in our HHS budgets. Um, a lot of that goes back to decisions that this governor made on his first day in office. Um, and, and you know, ramifications of Obamacare. Uh, those are things that we can't solve uh, by ourselves. We need the federal government to help us and, and cut some strings so that we can put in place some Minnesota solutions. Um, and we also need to do some things here uh, in Minnesota to solve this together, Republicans and Democrats together, because we can't see that kind of HHS growth. Mr. Speaker, along this. Here, let's go here first and then I'll come. Thank you. Um, along the same line, the governor said he believes that given the current economic climate, we've reached the limit of what we can do as far as investments, i.e. spending. Given the current economic climate, have we reached the limit on what we can do as far as tax cuts? Uh, I'm talking about Minnesota now, not federal. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, I think, I think that the, the example that we're seeing right now where the federal government, you know, the, had they passed a tax relief bill in June or July of this year, we would have a surplus today. So if the federal government had reduced taxes, we would have seen economic growth that would have forecasted a surplus into our budget. So we know that tax cuts are good for the economy. Everyone, those are basic economic principles. Um, if, you know, we, we certainly want to, you know, and if you look at our tax cuts, we gave, and as Senator Gazelka said, we gave money to seniors, to, to college students, to, to farmers. Um, these, are, these are things that we thought would bring our tax code in the state of Minnesota um, into, you know, better competitive, uh, uh, you know, relationships with the states around us and with other states. Um, we're losing a lot of revenue to other states. People can't afford to retire here. They can't afford to die here. They, uh, and they move their, their wealth to other states. And, and frankly, um, the folks here in Minnesota that stay here still have to pay those bills. Um, so uh, we're seeing Minnesota's uh, uh, economy become less and less uh, competitive because uh, we're such a high tax state. Sounds like what you're saying that is that even with the federal cuts, which will help business overall in the nation, that we still need to do more work here in Minnesota, either Mr. Speaker or Mr. Yeah, well, but the reason why I want to answer that, even before you ask that question, is if we get the federal tax bill, which we think we will have, 
uh, there's going to be winners and losers, and we need to look at Minnesota being a high-tax state. We have to relook at where are we taxing people, and if we do federal conformity or more of it, that is tax reduction. Well, the only way we're going to do it is if we have a surplus moving forward or we, re or we reduce spending. Uh, that is never easy, but that's something that we always have to look at for our future. Does it make sense that we would reduce spending somewhere so that we could provide more tax relief so that we can conform to this new tax bill that likely will happen? Well, it's interesting you say that because Senator Cohen said that, I think, do, if I'm not misquoting him, that doing conformity is, is just about, <laughs> it's not possible to do federal conformity. It would be too expensive. One of the Democrats well, Senator Bach said that. Uh, I'm sorry, the, Senator Bach. I apologize. It's, it sounds like you disagree with that, that conformity is a key point in terms of adjusting the business climate in Minnesota, mm -hmm. so it's more... So Senator Bach talked about overall federal conformity. Both he and I serve on the tax committee still. And uh, it's, the point is you, it's typically difficult to do all of it, but you have to pay attention to what the federal tax laws are and helping Minnesota remain competitive with the rest of the states. And that's why I'm saying wh whatever the final bill is that passes, we need to take a good look at and say, is there something we have to do in Minnesota so that we remain competitive with the rest of the states? And, you know, I'd, I'd like to add to that as well regarding the federal tax reform, since we don't know which bill is going to be yet. We, we, there's a lot of information we don't know. And so all that stuff is going to have to be taken into consideration, and our staff is going to have to look into it. One example is the estate tax. What if the federal government does away with the estate tax? We rely on federal information to have that. So there's going to have to be certainly adjustments to all these things, the state and local uh, tax deduction. We're going to there's going to have to be a lot of analysis to determine what this even means in our state going forward so that we can address the issues and make sure that we're being fiscally responsible in our state. So assuming that CHIP funding comes through and the <coughs> tax bill passes Congress and that wipes out a, a deficit this biennium, is there still any cause for concern in the tails of, you know, 500 million plus deficit? <coughs> What was the question? Was the question? The um, even even if you know the things that you're talking about with the chip bill and the tax bill are sorted out and that wipes out the deficit in this biennium, is there still cause for concern in well, the tails? Well, I think I think you'd couple it with the economic growth numbers. I think that we're forecasting. Uh, far too conservative of economic growth numbers moving forward. Um, I, I just wanted to point out when I talk about the spending increases, um, it, interesting, if you look at just the one line item, medical assistance, um, it's a $2 billion increase in just that one line item. Um, this all relates back to the decision that our governor made on his first day in office uh, when he signed an executive order uh, doing the early opt-in to Medicaid. Um, and the, and the chickens have come home to roost. We warned on that day that, that this was going to be a problem and the state couldn't afford um, that, sort of, uh, that sort of action. Um, it, we, we need to work together to get that spending under control or, or this is going to continue to be a problem. Um, and that's just literally one line item. It's a 19% increase, 19.5% um, increase just in that one line item. Uh, but that equates to, in our entire budget, that $2 billion increase, about a 5% increase in spending. Uh, general fund spending across the board in one line item. Um, equate that now to uh, a, a less than $600 million tax relief bill. Um, and I think you can see pretty clearly where the problem is. Um, it's, it's most certainly on the spending side. Yeah. yeah. I guess I'd say, I mean, we have to see how the February forecast would look to really say what happens in the out biennium. Obviously, that's, you know, going out up to three years from now, and so it's even more than three years. It's a little bit hard to predict, you know, that far out what it will be like. I suspect, based on, you know, the numbers I've seen, that if the federal tax bill passes, if we got the CHIP funding, that you'd see a, a big change in that number. But again, as the speaker was saying, we have some really big problems with spending increases here. Talking about medical assistance, you know, that whole health and human services area is just gobbling up all the other money we've got for all sorts of other places that people might like to put money to, tax relief as well as other uh, spending needs that uh, some people would like to do. And so uh, spending remains the real problem here that we have to get a handle on, and we've been trying to do that uh, on the Republican side, but we will be continuing to work on that and hope the governor will work with us. The question about working together to solve this, it, it seems like the tone from Senator Gazelka and the speaker are a little different. Uh, in terms of a more combative tone from you, sir, 
on just you know, the kinds of figures that are being put out there, uh, who's responsible. The governor had a more conciliatory tone, in my opinion. Are, are you going to be able to work this out amongst the leadership? Well, absolutely. Um, you know, th th I have never backed down from my commitment to work with everyone and, and anyone who wants to solve these problems, and, and we'll continue to do that. Um, you know, I understand people come to the, the, the microphone here and they want to put a little political spin on things. I was in the minority once myself and, and uh, uh, did that myself. And, and your job when you're in the minority is to get back to the majority. And, and I understand that uh, there's the, you know, reason to place blame or, or desire to. Um, I'm not blaming the governor at all for the situation that we're in. What I'm saying is, uh, these. No I agree with the governor, these numbers aren't accurate. Um, I don't think anybody has stood here today and said that these numbers are an accurate representation of where we're at. Um, I'm not blaming the governor uh, that we have a deficit today. What I'm saying is I don't think we actually do have a deficit today because the numbers presented today are not accurate numbers. They don't reflect um, the economic environment that we're in right now. Um, and and it, it, it's interesting that we're in this environment that moves uh, so, so rapidly and fluidly uh, that assumptions that were made one month ago now look completely antiquated. Um, but the reality is we've had much higher economic growth uh, in the last two quarters than what's predicted in this, uh, this particular uh, forecast. And I look forward, I'm optimistic, I look forward to a surplus in the February forecast and I'm very confident there will be one. Um, I think that will make our job a lot easier as we move into the next session. Um, and I think the governor believes the same thing. So uh, if, you, if you hear me blaming the governor, I hope that's not what you hear. Um, that's certainly not uh, my intent. But uh, I do agree with the governor that there are, uh, that we have been spending too much money. And I agree with the, the Senate Democrats that said that as well. I believe that the spending has been, the spending increase has been too high. If you look at, um, you know, in the last two bienniums, I'm going to use two because we've only had a one tax relief bill in two bienniums. The governor vetoed uh, the, the one in the previous biennium. Um, you look at tax relief versus spending increases, it's $12 of spending increase for every $1 of tax relief in those two bienniums. Um, that's a that's a big problem. <laughs> um, and, and the fact is, even when we have you know, $2.3 billion of revenue growth from last biennium to this and 3.2 from this to the next, spending is still outpacing that. $3.2 billion could get you 7% uh, uh, economic growth, but why are we, why are we predicting a, a deficit in the next biennium? We, we have additional revenue. There will be $3.2 billion of additional revenue next biennium, more than this biennium, but this forecast still predicts a deficit. That's very obvious where the problem is, right? It's not the revenue. The revenue will be there. The revenue would support a, a, a six, seven percent increase in spending next biennium, but we still have a, 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 a deficit uh, forecasted. That's a problem. I want to hit that. Uh, as I want to talk about that a little bit. I think it's important. Uh, uh, if, if you look at uh, myself and the speaker and the governor, we have three different personalities, but we're all trying to help Minnesota. And the line item veto of, of the legislative branch put a shadow over everything else that we all did together. I mean, we talked about the tax relief bill. Maybe the governor didn't want it as high, but he still wanted the tax relief bill. But we passed a transportation bill, significant, biggest in almost a decade, all three of us working together to get that done. We passed uh, at least a billion dollars of increase for, for K-12 funding with two major education reforms. Again, it was all of us working together. We got real ID done together. Sunday liquor, lots of people wanted that one done. But everywhere you turned, you found a working together, just you know something at the very end that overshadowed that. But if you look at actually what was accomplished by us working together, it's pretty, pretty great. All uh, House members will undergo new sexual harassment training ahead of next session under an agreement between the Speaker and the Minority Leader. The Minority Leader of the Senate says he plans to have all his members go through a refresher course between now and start of session. What's the plan for the Senate Republicans? So uh, before any of this came about, we had two December sessions. Uh, one was today, which is why Senator Bach was a little bit late. Uh, we have another one Thursday, and then we, pl we added another one for uh, February to make sure that everybody has had is up to date on their training. Uh, right away, I reviewed our the policy in in the Senate to make sure that you know, are we doing what we should be doing. Uh, we've we've always required that people have it when they first come in, and then every five years after. 
Uh, the only thing that we didn't do that right now that I see that we want to do is, is uh, that you don't get a pass by not getting it done every five years. And so, meaning they're supposed to have it after five years again, but if they don't have it done, we really didn't have a mechanism to say you're going to get it done. And we do have some plans there, but I haven't announced to uh, senators on both sides of, of the aisle what we're going to do, but there'll be more. Um, it's not okay to just not do it. And so, but as I looked at the process, I was glad that we had a good process in place from the start. Would it be mandatory for all Republican senators to have a new course prior to session? So for the, for the legislators, their elected officials, um, we can say you must take it. If they decide not to take it, we can't fire them. But there are other consequences that we can and will do. For staff, it's a different issue. If they don't take it, they, they're not going to work in the Senate. And you heard me ask the others as well about the level of transparency around this. Are you comfortable with the, where things are at, transparency-wise? Yeah, you know, it's a fine line because I've been uh, asked to, to release uh, uh, private information about where we're at. I, I can tell you, uh, I'll say today that I asked for the last 10 years, have we, has there been any official, you know, where people have uh, filed for sexual harassment in the Senate? There has not been, uh, but it's a a body that overturns or turns over quite a bit. I don't want to look back to the past. I want to look to where we're, we're heading. Uh, I immediately asked for my side of the aisle. What, what does anybody know? I talked to some of the, uh, the women on our side of the aisle to just to say, are you hearing things that I'm not hearing? Uh, because I'm very passionate about uh, making sure that we're doing everything we do, can do to, to have a workplace that people feel comfortable in. Do you want to tackle the transparency question also. sure uh, you know I'm I'm uh, you know I, th I think that uh, you know we've been fairly upfront with uh, you know what has happened in the house uh, I can pretty much only talk about what has happened since I've uh, been in charge of the house but we have not had you know the, the one complaint that you know about is the only uh, sexual harassment complaint we've had against a member uh, we did have one staff related one but there was no member involved in it um, it did not result in any lawsuit uh, or anything like that um, but we have had no uh, payouts or, or settlements or anything like that uh, in my time in fact uh, there was some reporting um, that I read earlier today that said that there had been a sexual harassment complaint against a member of the legislature um, uh, that happened uh, back when I think Democrats were in, in control of the legislature. Um, that was not reported. I did check with the Human Resources Department. That was not reported to them, um, which is our policy, uh, which is uh, alarming and concerning. Um, and that's the second time now since we've started this process that I have learned that uh, people who are mandatory reporters in the legislature uh, have not reported to HR. Um, uh, cases or instances of sexual harassment. Um, that is going to be something that we are going to deal with in our policy to make sure that everyone is educated and they know if you have something brought to you that you need to uh, deal with our, our uh, internal policy and make sure that we're dealing with that uh, in a way that, uh, frankly, will get to the bottom of the problem, uh, but also uh, respect the legalities that can be involved in that process. So um, I have been very strong and very stern that, uh, you know, uh, we will have a, a zero tolerance policy in the House for uh, sexual harassment. I, th I think that everyone, uh, whether they are employed here or whether they come here as the public or whether they work here uh, either in the press or as a lobbyist, uh, needs to feel that they are safe and respected in their workplace. Um, and this workplace doesn't just uh, mean that you are somebody that collects your paycheck from the state of Minnesota. Uh, there are a lot of other people that call this their workplace, um, and we're going to make sure that this environment uh, shows them uh, the respect that they deserve. So um, we will leave no stone unturned to make sure that our policies reflect the best effort that we can make uh, to ensure that people do feel uh, respected and protected here in the legislature. Have you received a, an invoice from your law firm from the lawsuit? <laughs> From the, from the work on the lawsuit, have you received an invoice yet? I don't know of any lawsuit. The work, oh, I'm sorry, different, different. Oh, the subject. defunding the legislature, I'm sorry, you're shifting. I was like, uh, I don't believe that we have, I have seen that yet. Yeah, I, I have not seen it. I don't, I don't know if my staff has seen it, but I don't think we've seen it. So, All right, thanks everybody. yeah, thank you. Thank you.